Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Come Back Stronger. I'm Dana Brooks with the Facebook Brook Law Offices, and I am here with my law partner, Kimmy Hogan. Hey. Welcome back. She's Thank filling you. in for uh, Jimmy Facing this week while he is uh, trying a case out of town. And we have got the second segment of our four-part interview with Captain Nilafar Ramani. Now, you're probably seeing her. She's showing up on a lot of um, news programs, uh, radio interviews. Um, she's got an incredible, incredible story. Yes. And last week we had the section that kind of leads up to her becoming the first female pilot in the Afghan Air Force. Uh, and it talked a little bit about her. We, we uh, heard from her about her growing up and what it was like growing up in Afghanistan, having to flee because of all the, the political and military chaos going, mm -hmm. going there. Um, what did you think about her story? Oh, what I loved heard it. So far? She's so strong, and it's just amazing what she's been able to do in the face of such adversity. Uh -huh. You know, she talked a lot about how in her society and her culture at the time when she was growing up, it was shameful to have a girl. Yeah, it brought shame on your family. It brought shame on your family. You weren't, uh, kid, girls weren't able to go to school. She is one of five children. There's four sisters and one brother, and her parents really encouraged the daughters mm -hmm. and taught them how to read and write and said, you know, go for your dreams, we support you. And that ended up being a real motivating factor for her in yeah. going to become a pilot. Yeah, and you know, when, whenever she was young, uh, she, she was born during the Civil War in her country and, uh, and a lot of unrest in her country and they had to flee. And the, this is a woman who was taught to read by her own mother, you know, in a tent. Not, not in a school by certified teachers like we're so accustomed to, but it does show you one thing, doesn't it? The power of education. You know, the first thing people want to do when they want to control you is to take away your ability mm -hmm. to learn. Uh, they take away your education. And so many times that's done to women and girls, but she wasn't having it. Her parents weren't having it. And boy, did she go on to reach her dream. So when we come back, it'll be actually the third segment in a four-part interview of Carrie Roan with Captain Ramani right after this. I recently had a new client and she suffered a mild traumatic brain injury okay. and she had no idea what had happened that caused her to be injured. Mm. Um, gotcha. But it turns out she had fallen into a pit at an oil change oh. station. And it was 100% oh, their fault. Oh, wow. But, she, but her injury made her not even understand. Her injury, and it makes, it, me, it makes me so frustrated because mm -hmm. folks that suffer concussions or mild traumatic brain injuries, it's really difficult for them to know to what remember, happened right? and to understand yeah. the difference in what their life was and what it is now yeah. because of the nature of their condition. And so the insurance companies need to recognize the full value of that yeah, yeah. instead but of taking advantage of that very unique situation it took yeah. her family telling her you need to call an attorney right. mm -hmm. her family coming with her to the appointment mm -hmm. to say these are the differences mm -hmm. to get her in there and now we're able to help her mm -hmm. i love that And we are back for our third section of our interview carrie runs interview with captain nilafar romani all right, Captain, so we're back from the break, and I'm interested to know, um, after you went through all these hurdles, after you became a captain in the Air Force, and you went through everything to fly, and you were actually flying, you were still persecuted by the Taliban. What, what was that like, and what were they doing to you and your family? Unfortunately, uh, when my face became so public, because... All I wanted to do and the U.S. wanted to do is encourage more women and little girls to just choose what they want to do for their life because we just left once and we want to use it in a good way, not waste it. Because once we are older and uh, we just want to look back and be proud of what we have done in life and we haven't wasted our life. And um, because, you know, like they were uh, so supportive and um, they always stood by me, you know, they just wanted to encourage little girls and the women and show for the society to the, all the world to view Afghanistan differently because everybody knows Afghanistan is a war zone place and they don't know what's really happening. So the U.S. and, you know, they all wanted to, by me going to the media with the uniform, encouraging lots of little girls to, you know, have some type of inspiration for everybody absolutely um, that turned out to be a negative uh, against me and uh, most of the people they abused it they took out photos and they you know over we all know how social media works and 
basically um, it separated all over the country that I was not even able to leave my home. And I was going out and I had to cover my face. My only security that I had was my brother and my father to escort me to work and come back because our government supported uh, me nothing with nothing. And basically they always told me it's my choice and I can leave right now because they cannot protect me. And unfortunately the Taliban, of course, if you're a woman, you are the first, first, um, you know, the first attack for them. Like, oh, this is one person. Let's just silent her, torture her and destroy her to show to the U.S. Okay, whatever you're trying to bring, we're going to destroy it. And Fortunately, you know, some of the local people, um, the way that they would put the pictures, they would make me look like she's not a good Muslim. She works with America. She needs to be, you know, like this, dishonored our culture, dishonored our religion, and she needs to be punished. She needs to be tortured. And I'm just looking through all this social media and I'm like, it's all lies. All I do is serving my country and I'm bringing, you know, I'm just serving my country. And, but unfortunately they didn't see it that way. And the threat for me and my family started to get very serious at the time that um, it breaks my heart to even talk about it. That uh, my only brother got shot twice. And oh my gosh. Thank God he survived. And it has been, you know, so much, so much, um, you know, they tried to destroy me as much yeah. as they could. But well, and let me let me just make something clear too. The pictures of you in the media are in your flight suit and in your uniform. They're not pictures of you on Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue or doing things which would could ever be characterized as anything other than acting as a pilot for the Afghan Air Force. And they took those pictures and and took those to mean that you were still going against Islam, religion, culture, the country. I mean, that's just unbelievable. In 2013, you know, like in aviation, we have a costume. When you fly just yourself and you go solo, um, you know, you have to be thrown in a tank of water or mm -hmm. pool. And, you know, me being the only female and fly solo and successfully get it done and come back, of course, the entire Air Force wanted to make this custom and tradition happen. So there was two female, one American um, female and uh, another uh, British female. You know, when you're in the, in the uniform, especially, you know, most of the American women, they're beautiful, they are tall, uh, and, you know, they have a hat and they tie their hair. Nobody would ever think those were a woman, especially, you know, when you're in the uniform. And uh, when they uh, hugged me to throw me in the pool of water, unfortunately, uh, some people around, you know, there was like a hundred, over a hundred people just waiting for me to see if I could fail my solo or not. So they were around there and waiting. And when, um, you know, there was two female actually did this and they throw me in the pool of water and they took a picture and showed it in the social media that she's not a Muslim anymore. Those are American and they're trying to baptize her. Oh and I just, I just look at all these people and I'm like, what is like no human being do this to another yeah. human being. Yeah. And it's just unfortunate. They could and find a way. And so your brother got shot twice. Who do you know who shot him? Unfortunately, in Afghanistan, when something happens, it happens and nobody even tries to find the person did it and nobody really wants to go after it and that happened twice not only one time because there was a time in my life and career that I couldn't even go to fly even sometimes more than 30 days and you know we have a currency that I had to fly in the air force if it was more than 30 days I had to go you know like over more trainings just because I passed my 30 days limit and that was the case for me because we were some Sometimes relocating from our home twice a month, sometimes three times a month, just because uh, for me, it's not only Taliban, it wasn't only the local people, my own extended family or thinking I dishonored them and I deserve to be honor killed just because I put them down just by did what I did. And it's just not one side. There's so many, you know, people behind it that which one we could run away and we were all alone. Just my father, 
and us just protecting each other. And, you know, there's a point that I would think everybody would tell me, please, it's enough. We are done. But unfortunately, with everything happened in our life, uh, my my dad and my family, nobody even told me it's enough. You have to just stop it before, you know, something serious happened. Even at the time that I thought I'm going to give up after what happened to my brother, they were the one told me if I give up, this is not my home. I cannot come back to this home. So um, I have been blessed to have such kind of family in my life. Absolutely. And when we come back from the break, I want to talk about how you wound up seeking asylum in the United States and what you're doing now to further be a pilot for the American Air Force and then the book that you wrote. Absolutely. Wow. Now that's a comeback stronger story. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm trying to imagine what it's like for her in her environment. These, these are people, it's not just the Taliban, it's not just the, you know, um, dominant culture. Some of her own extended family felt like she brought shame on them. She said just by really existing, just by being herself. But boy, it, d it goes to show you, boy, social media, that's just a monster. I don't care what side of what ocean you are on. Oh, yeah. um, if you get into, she gets into it in her book, she talks about there's so many fake, fake uh, social media accounts that mm -hmm. purport to be her because they're trying to dishonor her and bring shame on her. Yep, because she's doing such a good thing. Yeah. And they're just trying to take it down. Well, she's upset in the apple cart over there and they don't yeah. like it. But, um, you know, it's just, it, it's amazing how, you know, and, and, you know, I know of which I speak whenever people just decide to put a beat on you and just spread lies. Mm -hmm. You know, people are, are a lot of time more receptive to the lies than they are the truth. Truth isn't very sexy sometimes and all those, um, you know, outlandish uh, accusations are. But she's, she's not immune to that. And, and again, I just don't know how she gets up and keeps pushing through. I'm so glad her parents said, mm -hmm. no, if you, if you give into this, your brother will have gotten shot twice for nothing. Yep, you you will have, going. You know, we will have relocated sometimes two or three times a month for nothing. That's wild. Just another hurdle. She's got to fly every 30 days and yeah. she's having to move and hide just so she can keep doing her job. Yeah. But they pick up and say, no problem, we're, we keep going. You know, uh, I hope they see the air in their ways now because they basically created this <laughs> invincible woman and uh, you know, she's not going to stop, can't be stopped. And now she's uh, infecting other women with her power and her confidence. So uh, I can't wait for the wrap up segment with uh, Captain Amani and find out what she's doing now to continue her journey and then to help other women as well. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. You know what's funny? When law firms advertise that they'll give a free consultation, every consultation we give is free unless we can get you a settlement based on your injuries. Right. Every time you give me a call, it's free. Yeah. I yeah. want you to give me a call. Right. Yeah. You know, we're not going to charge you unless we actually get you something for yeah. your case. That's right. mm -hmm. You don't have to pay me anything unless I win the case. Right. And on top of that, I'm going to pay for all of the court costs and the deposition costs and medical records costs and expert opinion costs. All of that's coming out of my pocket. And if we don't win the case, then we eat those costs at no charge to right. you. Right. So we don't take a case we don't believe in because it's not in our interest. Right. And we don't minimize or devalue your case because that's also not in our interest so it makes everything fair if you have a lawyer on a contingency fee you can hire the very best right. lawyer and we are back with the final segment in Carrie Rohn's interview with Captain Amani Romani so you said something earlier I wanted to ask you real quick about, you said it was not only the Taliban, but it was your extended family. Who did you mean by that? Because you were running from the Taliban and you had to run from certain family members? Correct, because, you know, um, as we say, all five hand fingers are not the same size. In the family, not every member of your family or your extended families are the same. Their mentality, the way they think, the way they analyze life and think about life is so different. So because my father was completely a different person and I sometimes don't even think he was born there. Yeah. <laughs> completely different person. And uh, because the way he let me do, uh, which most of the Afghan parents wouldn't let their daughter do, um, it's, I don't want to specifically mention who they were, but um, they were some, some of our extended family that they knew everything about our life. 
every little secret. They knew about where we live, where our home is, what we do, what my parents do, where's our schools, where's my brother and my sisters. So it was hard to hide from your own family because they were just, they were thinking that I dishonored them by, um, you know, breaking um, against my religion, my culture. And in Afghanistan, they believe in something called uh, honor kill, which means if they couldn't catch me and kill me, they can go to any member of my family, even if it is a, a one-year-old child. And if they kill that person and that little child, that's their honor is complete. And unfortunately, that's what most of the people believed. And um, which, which is very upsetting that why even sometimes it doesn't work as much as we try to explain to them, tell them what the reality is. All they believe is what they see and what they think. Right. Right. And so I, as I understand it, I think they threatened at one point to kill your parents. And is that when you decided to seek asylum? And, and I think you and one of your sisters moved here, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, as I mentioned, um, the U.S. and a U.S. embassy in Kabul in Afghanistan, they were all aware of my situation, that I can barely come to work, I can barely fly, and they knew I had zero support from government. Either I would get killed or I stay at home and uh, try to hide. And there was a, a point in my life that we had to, the security was so bad that they found where we live, and we had to leave and go to India. We stayed in India, and I uh, just as a tourist visa and just wanted them to feel that I left Air Force. I'm not in Air Force anymore if they could leave us alone. And even after, you know, three months, I came back to the country. I was hoping things were going to change. They think I left, but that wasn't the case. I saw government against me that I left um, the Air Force without letting, know, le letting them know where I am just because it was hard for me to trust who I could tell where I am after all those threats me and my family were receiving. And uh, luckily the U.S. Uh, was aware of all the situation and even uh, the U.S. Embassy reached out to our first lady that seek her help. And unfortunately, I never heard from them. I never even got, got a single text or email that what we can do for you. And I was very disappointed, like very disappointed because providing a security for one person is nothing, nothing at all. But if you just don't care, of course, it's a big deal. And um, things got very serious. And um, luckily, I got a scholarship to, you know, leave Afghanistan, come to the U.S., and fly C-130s and go to training. And um, that was another part of the story that they didn't want me to be part of this uh, training because they preferred a man to be um, one of the student uh, among you know, this um, trade scholarship. And they would have not let me, um, they didn't sign my paperwork to go to this training because they wanted to give this a spot for a man. And luckily, with the support of U.S., I got this uh, scholarship and I was able to attend the training. And it took one and a half year to go through the um, training and I uh, graduated. I got my um, rating and then all this one and a half year, I was unaware of what's happening to my family. My family were struggling back home with extended family, with the people that I wish that was the case that I just left and it would be the end of this story. Right, but it'd be well, over, yeah. As I mentioned, that was something they believed as an honor count. And um, the first time in entire my life, I would hear my dad with his voice that I'm so excited to tell him, I'm coming home to see you guys after one and a half year. And he would tell us that they are leaving. There's no place for me to come back. And that was the worst thing, you know, anybody could hear because all I had is my parents and yeah. nobody else I had back home. I would go to the, you know, just hand myself to the people that were just waiting for me to come back to kill me. And oh um, it was a hard, hard decision for me to make. And um, for a long time, I was very depressed actually thinking about it, that how easy, um, you know, I had to give up on my career. And that's something that I worked so hard um, and wanted, you know, to make it happen. And I wanted to encourage more girls and right. to stand up for themselves. But unfortunately, one person, as much as you try to stay strong, 
um, there will be a point that you have to choose. If you want to choose your family, you want to choose your career or to be alive. And that was the time for me that I had to give up on one to choose another. And I'm sure your dad's very proud of you as is your mom, you know, your entire family. I'm sure they are because as much as they're proud of me, I'm so proud to have them in my life too. Yeah, absolutely. So what are you doing now to become part of the United States Air Force? Um, I wish. Um, so the only problem is that citizenship, it's delaying everything because I would love to serve the country that they gave my life back. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't because of the U.S. support. Absolutely. And because they always fought for me. And, um, you know, like I'm always thankful for that. And I would never forget, um, you know, the life that they gave me back for what my people took away from me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I actually waiting for the citizenship, because if you don't have a citizen, you cannot join um, the military as an officer and be a pilot. And I'm really hoping that will happen sometime soon. So I, I will be able to make that dream happen again, too. Good. I can't wait to see that happen for you. I can't and, wait. And you wrote a book or you're writing a book? Yes, my book is actually already published uh, in July 6. And you can see it right there. So it's called <laughs> Open Skies. Open Skies. And it was um, published on July 6. And um, um, it, it's, it's very exciting for me, you know, writing the book was very emotional. And I just want by most of like publishing the book to tell for most of the people in the world, not only for Afghanistan, that everything we have in life, we shouldn't take it for granted, because there is other people, other kids on the other side of the world that what we take for granted because life gets so easy, there is somebody's big dream. They wanted to have that and, um, you know, never give up and some kind of an inspiration for the people that they read the book. At least they think, okay, I have everything in life. Why should I not do good for my life why should I just not take advantage of what I have and be happy for every morning I wake up and be thankful for what I have and where I was born right I love that well thank you so much for being here with us today I, I'm just amazed by your story and I can't wait to see where life takes you and um, I can't wait to cheer you on from the sidelines I'm so excited and I'm glad you're going to be serving the United States pretty soon I'm really excited about that Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, such a brave young woman. Um, you know, I think this came up in there, but she applied for and was granted asylum in 2018. And that's what allowed her to come to the United States. But like she said, you know, she thought just leaving, it would take mm -hmm. care of all those problems. But no, there's still a thirst for blood in mm -hmm. her country to pay her back for all, you know, the rabble rousing she's done to their women. That's terrifying how she talked about honor killings and yeah. how to satisfy honor, anybody in her family could be killed. Including and a child. Including a, a child and it's her extended family yeah. that is coming after them some too. Yeah. She needed to be, what they say, uh, dishonored or, or something. And, you know, it, it, it was so demoralizing what she must have gone through because they're stripping everything from her. They're stripping her culture. They tried to say she wasn't a good Muslim and that mm -hmm. she was baptized when they put her in the water. And, you know, just a little bit of truth that someone who wants to do bad can turn into, you know, all kinds of mm -hmm. horrible accusations. So, you know, she was forced out of her homeland. Um, you know, uh, pitted family members against her, yeah. you know, made her look like a dishonorable bad person when she's really just trying to encourage other people. But what resiliency. It really struck me how she said, I came to a point where I had to choose my family, my career, or my life. Right. Wow. Yeah. How, who has to do that? Yeah. that? That is something most people don't ever find themselves in. Mm -hmm. When I'm listening to it, it reminds me of um, the mafia. Yeah. You know, it's like one of those things, like they make the rules, you mm -hmm. want to get out, you can't get out, they control everything. But um, we'll be back right after the break and we'll wrap up this fantastic two-part series. I went to lunch with one of my former clients the other day and she's doing great. She took the money from her settlement and she started her own company buying and selling vehicles, oh my God. which is really cool because she was in a car crash and then needed oh. a new vehicle. And so now she's able to help other yeah. folks out. 
Most of our clients, they find that one of the most frustrating things is the dealing with the vehicle. Oh, well, lo losing your car it can yeah. totally disrupt your life. You could, you could lose your livelihood over it. If you can't get to work or, or, you know, what's the worst thing with our clients is we're just trying to help them get well. But if they can't get to the, the health care that they need, you know, that's just another setback. One of the typical things about a comeback story is you take the pain and the struggles and the challenges that you've been through and you use that as the fire that kind of motivates you to do something good for other people. Yeah. And so I love that because now our client did exactly that, like literally to <laughs> the T. And we are back to finish up our series uh, that Carrie runs interviews with Captain Romani, the first Afghan um, female pilot. And now we are lucky that she is in America. Yes. And um, unfortunately, we can't give you her location because she still still fears retribution. And, and we're not talking about, you know, just people being you know, ugly to her. We're talking about it puts her and her family's real lives in danger because of her pursuing her goals. Yeah, absolutely. Well, she wanted us to make sure to give a shout out yes, to did. a flight school that's been helping her. It's Paragon Flight School has really been helping her in her journey. Yeah, and, and you know, it's so important because like she said, you know, pilots, th that's constant training, constant yeah. flying, constant, constant, constant. And you can't just say, well, I was a pilot three years ago, I'll get back into it. It doesn't work that way. And that's, you know, for good reason. You don't, you don't want a rusty pilot ever. Um, but she's, uh, you know, also got to learn a different culture. She's an outsider in, in a country that's foreign to her, even though she's very grateful to the United States for all the help and support that um, we've given her. Um, it's just, I don't, I don't know how she does it. Thank God she was able to bring her sister with her so she has some family. No. But um, that's pretty bold for any 30 year old to take on, much less, you know, with everything she's got going. But I, I looked at her book, and again, it's Open Skies, uh, My Life as Afghanistan's First Female Pilot, uh, Captain Neela Four Romani. Um, but she dedicates her book to, for all the women of Afghanistan who dream. So this is for all the women who dream. So um, thank you for watching us again. And if you have another uh, Come Back Stronger story you think we ought to have on, let us know. And join us on social media, Facebook, and see us at facingbrooks.com. Thanks, everyone. And you know what the insurance company offered him? Five thousand dollars really? he's completely he's completely blind and they offer him five thousand dollars yeah. ask him ask him to sign a release to a lot of people especially when they're hurting and when they're down and when they're vulnerable five thousand dollars is a life-changing right. amount yeah. of money yeah. and they're not looking at the mm -hmm. value of what has been lost they're not looking at what it would take to to make that person whole which mm -hmm. is our job yeah mm -hmm. that's our job their job isn't. Their job is to save the insurance company money. Right. And they look at this person and they go, hmm, I bet $5,000 would get your full attention. Right. And they mm -hmm. come in and they dangle it yeah. with a settlement release. And then mm -hmm. once you sign it, you're done. You can't come back to us and ask us to make, wave a magic wand and make that go away. That can't go away. Mm -hmm. My client didn't accept the $5,000. We took them all the way to trial. We got a $5 million verdict. Wow. 